I want to tell a story. Just a brief summary of history. Not the history of the world or of war or anything else, but rather just a specific community. The LGBT community. Our story begins more than 120 years ago in 1897, when a gay German man, Magnus Hirschfeld, decided to found the Scientific Humanitarian Committee in Berlin, the first LGBT rights organization in history, pushing for the scientific research and legal rights of LGBT people. In 1916, Hirschfeld furthered his ambitions and went ahead to establish the Institute of Sexual Research or Institute of Sexology, the world's first institute dealing solely with the scientific research of human sexuality and gender. The institute staff almost entirely consisted of queer people and it became a hub for intellectuals and other curious people alike to explore an extensive catalogue of books and research around sexual orientation and sexual identity. But it also became a cl medical clinic and shelter catering to LGBT peoples. It provided the very first modern gender confirmation surgeries for trans people. It helped spread information about STDs. It even provided free housing for LGBT people in poverty or homelessness. The Institute fascinated scientists from all over the world, garnering, garnering up to 20,000 visits from Europe alone. Even prominent figures like Albert Einstein supported the Institute's work. And that was all the way in 1916. So then, why did it take so long for the first LGBT rights movements to begin, like the gay liberation movement in 1969? I mean, the Scientific Humanitarian Committee was founded all the way in the 1890s, and Hirschfeld founded the Institute for Sexology by 1916. So between 1916 and the LGBT rights movements with the Gay Liberation Movement in 1969, that's a gap of more than 50 years. So what happened? Why did it take so long for things to start moving along? One man, one party. In 1933, a group of young German students and SA members would go would target the Institute of Sexology and confiscate its catalogue of books, research, images, journals, and even patient names and addresses. They threw all of the research into a pile and lit them up, burned all of it destroying decades of research, some of the only existing research of its kind, in an instant. And Hirschfeld lived the little years he had of his life in exile, passing away in 1935. The Institute's main administrator would be sent to a concentration camp where he would face brutal treatment. The Nazis used the addresses and names the Institute held to find, arrest, and execute many LGBT folks in its purges, especially during the Night of the Long Knives. <laughs> 
the Institute's building would be completely obliterated by the 40s and demolished by the 50s. The Nazis single-handedly destroyed nearly 20 years of some of the only existing research that supported sexual orientation and gender identity. And to make things worse, the world's priorities changed as the Second World War raged on. And by the end of the war in 1945, Hirschfeld's work had become forgotten. There was no internet or other database or public interest to archive his work, and it had legitimately just vanished from public consciousness. During the Institute's short lifespan, its research had impacted many scientists and intellectuals across Europe. But that was only Europe. The same could not be said for the United States, where in 1952, the deeply influential American Psychiatric Association would publish the first edition of its Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which classed homosexuality as a mental disorder, and to make it worse, specifically as a sociopathic personality disturbance, essentially saying it was a kind of antisocial behavior. And then you might think, well, surely this would mostly just impact the United States, since in Europe there were people still alive then who would have heard or read about the Institute of Sexology's research. This would not be the case. America's APA was the only notable organization of its kind, and its DSM was quickly adopted as a standard around the world. And so the public view of LGBT people would worsen with the Cold War, as mass anti-communist hysteria would help prominent figures such as Senator Joseph McCarthy to accuse any quote-unquote social deviants for anything, even if it didn't make sense. And this included accusing homosexuals as threatening national security because they might provide state secrets to the Soviet Union. This set up a world where another institute of sexology could not exist. There were very little prominent scientists in support of LGBT people, and whatever research had existed would be quickly censored as either encouraging social deviance or being communist. There was no scientist or research institute to back them up. The only thing they could do is take matters into their own hands. And so, they did. In the June of 1969, a gay bar in Lower Manhattan called the Stonewall Inn was raided by New York police. A common occurrence at this point, but this time was different. The bar's patrons had decided they weren't going to stand down. They fought back. Despite not having the weapons or manpower of the police, the patrons fought back with just their fist. And so this incredibly powerful display would spark the first ever LGBT rights movement, including the gay liberation movement, in, in June 1969. And this would spread all across the United States, the Western world, and eventually even some of the Eastern world too. 
the world of science finally began to catch up and began to pick up from where Hirschfeld left. Well, not really, I had to start by, from scratch, but the world finally began to catch up. Identity, transgenderism, sexual orientation finally came back into public consciousness. Today, the year is 2022. It has been more than 50 years since the Stonewall Inn riots, and more than 100 since the Scientific Humanitarian Committee and the Institute of Sexual Research. But for some of you right now, particularly in the United States, it feels like society is regressing into a third wave of hysteria. In 2021 alone, more than 290 anti-LGBT bills were put forward in the US, with 25 of them being passed into law. And now there's even more being put forward. And so you might be wondering, well, I've been talking about historical circumstances. How have they related to this conversation? The reason is because I want to shed light on an idea, something optimistic. The Nazis were brutal. They murdered the undesirable, raided homes, and destroyed anything that opposed the status quo. The Cold War governments detained and arrested homosexuals, trans people, and raided gay bars. And now, for many of you, it feels like America is about to go through another period of oppressing LGBT people. I want to convey some things. In the history that I've talked about, I've mostly talked about times where not only was the LGBT community facing oppression from governments, but also oppression from wider society. And that's where this part comes in. I believe this time is different because here society is actually in your favor. I know that's difficult to believe, especially when on sites like Twitter you see shit tons of homophobes and transphobes after the other. But see, social media sites are honestly a pretty shit way to gauge just the societal values since they tend to be more like echo chambers than anything. Statistically, most Americans are in LGBT favor. A study earlier this year, for example, from the Human Rights Campaign found that up to 8 in 10 Americans are in favor of non-discrimination laws protecting LGBT people including states putting forward anti-LGBT bills. For example, the study found that 80% of Floridians were in support of laws protecting LGBT people. Then in Indiana, it was 77%, South Dakota, 74 Arizona, 77 Kentucky, 71 Alabama, 69 and Oklahoma, 75 these politicians do not even represent the majority of the American people. And I believe that is something significant to consider. But then, even with the politicians, the study also found that support for pr the protection of LGBT people is greatly bipartisan with 89% of Democrats in favor, 82% of independents, and up to 65% of Republicans. For the most part, it's just been this bastard minority 
of politicians who are doing these god-awful garbage things. But I am aware that even with this, even with a majority of societal backing, many of you will still be in deep fear and, skeptic and skeptical regardless. After all, you could just say, well, clearly these politicians in the minority will still have more power considering they're able to push these bills. And so, what's the point? Well, to this perspective, I offer an optimistic stance. The point is, the LGBT community still exist. Now, I don't mean LGBT individuals because, of course, they've always existed and will continue to exist. But I mean the wider and connected community, which has been able to thrive and be able to be in public consciousness and public presence and have a culture, have symbolisms, venues, celebrations, all of these things have been existing and continued to exist despite the Nazis, despite authoritarian governments around the world, despite Cold War era hysteria, the community still exists. It exists in the US, it exists on international, national and local scales. And those were through some of the worst and most oppressive times in history. We are now living in a time where the community has a much stronger voice than it has had the ever had the opportunity to have. And we're seeing this in the US with protesters, with activists. And so even if things do get bad, you will have a pretty good majority of American and international society in favor. And I believe everyone's voices will be heard. I can't tell you when this will happen, but it will. One day, these selfish politicians will lose their voice and power. Happy Pride Month, everyone. I hope this has provided something optimistic for all of you to consider. And I love all of you. You are all beautiful exactly as you are. And you're going to make it through this. We've done it before and we will do it again.